childhood adversity, and 13 of them had replicated the effect within the region that we studied um, in the, uh, the human hippocampus or rat hippocampal glucocorticoid receptor promoter, which means that you can study those marks, it would seem, meaningfully. Um, <coughs> we can get into question period as to why we think those marks might be coordinated across different tissues, but the point is they can be. So um, we and, and other groups have started to try to say, well, potentially this mark may be of some clinical importance. Keep in mind, these are, these are really rudimentary preliminary studies, and the question here is just to ask whether or not this epigenetic mark may have any relationship with, with clinical outcomes. So this is work in collaboration with, uh, with Rachel Yehuda. Uh, it's looking at U.S. combat veterans uh, through the uh, Afghani or Iraqi theaters, half of whom have PTSD, half of whom do not. Uh, they're matched for combat exposure, and what you see is that methylation of this particular region of the glucocorticoid receptor is uh, predictive and associated with symptom severity. So it may actually turn out to be a reasonable readout of, of severity of PTSD symptomatology. And then we did what is really just a proof of principle study. We asked whether or not this might be predictive of treatment outcome. And in this particular case, what we're doing pre and post is to look at uh, methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor promoter follow, uh, prior to psychotherapy with, PT, with a, a similar, in fact, the same cohort of PTSD uh, individuals. And you can see that, indeed, uh, the methylation of the promoter is associated with urinary cortisol levels, uh, dexamethasone feedback. All of this is quite predictable. What turns out to be interesting is that it also, at least in a small population, is predictive of treatment response. So as Andre was talking about earlier, um, this is an area I think that is as ripe for investigation. Andre's studies are, I think, at very much at the forefront in thinking about how to use biological markers and even perhaps more importantly, why to use those associated with maltreatment. But these are sort of absolutely essential in the hands of clinicians to be able to understand um, predictive outcomes. But I think they also address potentially, and I think a great point that was made by Martin Teicher yesterday is the idea of thinking of childhood maltreatment as something that is going to color your perception of virtually any form of, of pathology, psychopathology with which you deal, and how it may inform you in terms of treatment outcomes. So I think there are ways of being able to think about that. <coughs> and now I want to get to the sales pitch. So you remember, I, I'm still bitter, as you can see, about the human genome stuff. If they got all this money on a sales pitch, so this is mine, okay? So I'm running it past you as before I, I head off looking for billions. <coughs> um, we've started uh, to finally move beyond looking at a single region of the genome and starting to ask the question about how variation in epigenetic marks are created at the level of the, the genome-wide uh, perspective. And so we ask, can we look at global influences of environmental conditions and to what extent are they moderated by genotype? So here's the study. Um, it comes from one of, uh, this is just a subsample of our Singaporean birth cohort. So this is a classic longitudinal birth cohort. Moms are recruited at 10 to 13 weeks gestation. And we've been following them up. The oldest child will turn six years of age on November 30th. So this is an in-progress study. We have umbilical cords. We managed to get conceptual tissue from 92% of the, of the births in, in the cohort. We've genotyped. We have multiple measures, uh, particularly of ma maternal health and well-being. And essentially what we're doing is we're asking about variation across the epigenome. So we use principal component analysis, which you heard earlier from Kieran. And what we're doing essentially is, is what most are doing. We're trying to relate environmental signals to variation in the epigenome and to genomic function, that is transcription. Now what we understand, of course, is that all of that occurs against a background of genotypic variation. And as you've heard uh, through many particular talks, the impact of environmental signals on basically any measure of phenotype is moderated by genotypic variation. So we wanted to ask the question about to what degree does that actually occur at the level of the epigenome? <coughs> so we have 237 subjects. This is umbilical cord ge uh, 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 genomic DNA. Um, and what you're looking at right here is a principal component analysis of single nucleotide polymorphisms, genetic variants across this population. As you can see, PCA 
quite effectively segregates the three ethnic groups. These are ethnic Chinese, Malay, and ethnic Indians, easily segregated um, at the level of genetic variation, not quite so easily at the level of the epigenetic variation. Okay? So clearly, one is seeing variation produced at the level of the epigenome. And the question then is, how is that produced? How does one go from a very coherent genetic structure ethnically to one that is epigenetically quite variable? So first thing we wanted to do was to ask questions about the relationship of the SNPs, the individual genetic polymorphisms, to um, the epigenome. <coughs> so we took the entire epigenome. And we first of all did what Kieran described. We reduced the data. We reduced it down to those genomic regions that showed variability. So these are called variable methylated regions. They're regions of about 1,000 base pairs with at least two CPGs, cytosines, that show variation at greater than 10%. So it's regions where one can see variability, which seems like a pretty reasonable place to hunt for the sources of variation. We found 1,423 of these type of regions across the genome, and we've got 1.4 million polymorphisms. So we decided that since the Computing Resource Center had nothing better to do, we would regress every one of the 1.4 million SNPs against each one of the 1,423,000 variably methylated regions. Three and a half weeks later, you get a correlational matrix which tells you which SNP is most highly correlated to each of the 1,423 variably methylated regions. We use that as a, as a proxy message uh, for genetic influence. Essentially, just the bottom line, <coughs> most of the polymorphisms that influence methylation are in proximity to where the cytosine is. Pretty much predictable. But we've got a measure. We also have all these environmental measures. And we can then use just simple regression models and ask, of the 1,423 variably methylated region, what percentage are best explained by the genetic influence, that is the SNP most highly correlated, by the environmental, message, uh, environmental um, variable, which is the maternal health um, in uterine um, uh, in, in index, and or by an interaction between the two. And here, after that clumsy explanation, is the answer. It's 25% were best explained by genetics. Not uniquely, but best, okay? The remaining 75% were best explained by an interaction between the genetic, this most highly correlated SNP, and the individual environmental measure. That could be uh, birth weight, maternal smoking, parity, maternal age, maternal depression, maternal BMI, etc. 75% best explained by G by E. You'll have done the math. None are best explained by environment alone. So I say, well, okay, but you know, in some cases that regression model is going to explain a lot of the variance. In some cases, not so much. What if you drill down a little bit? <coughs> well, the first thing you do is you notice that because this is a multi-ethnic sample genetically, You've inflated your estimate of genetics by including those multi-ethnic groups. If you then restrict it only to the Han Chinese, which account for 70% of the, the population, this falls to 15%. You still see now 85% is gene by environment, still zero for environment. Okay, well, let's go on. What about the 650 variably methylated regions that are best explained by either genetic or G by E models? for which there's no substantial support for the next best model, right? This is a really good explanation. What you end up with is genome falls, G by E enlarges, E never appears on the scene. Okay, let's get ridiculous. Let's take the 31 variably methylated regions for which there's no evidence of any model other than the one in your regression. Then what happens is it's all G by E. It's never E alone. It's always G by E. <coughs> and this is just, I think, a, a, a case in point. We took what is one of the poster childs in biological psychiatry for neuronal plasticity. This is the, um, the uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, RS6265, in the BDNF gene. Um, it confers a val to met conversion. Um, and what we did then was to focus only at um, one single environmental factor, which should be maternal depression since we use the EPDS. Uh, it's actually maternal anxiety. We use the STI. 
And here, first of all, you see the influence of the SNP on methylation. So this is methylation levels at a CPG within the BDNF gene, and you can see that they vary quite clearly as a function of genotype alone. What we then do is to look at maternal anxiety, antenatal maternal anxiety, and we ask what is the correlation, how many variably methylated CPGs are influenced by antenatal maternal um, anxiety as a function of infant genotype. And as you can see in the MET, MET, there's almost three to four times the number of CPGs that are associated with maternal anxiety compared to the uh, VALMET or VALVAL groups. Um, that's true whether one uses state or trait. And that effect is unique to the infant genotype. You don't see it if you look at the maternal. So infant genotype is moderating the impact of antenatal maternal anxiety. It's just one of those cases in point. So the conclusion we would make here is that the function of the genome is indeed regulated by the environment, but that that occurs in concert with um, genotype. Now, what it insists is that most of the epigenetic variation that we see is a function of G by E interaction, meaning that some of these epigenetic readouts might be interesting markers. Uh, they might be readouts for the relevant G by E interactions that you've heard about over the course of today. So that's part of our measure of enthusiasm for looking at the epigenome itself as a potential um, as a potential reflection not only of exposure to adversity, but of, in fact, it's also its genetic moderation. How am I doing for time? Oh, good. This time just flies when you're having fun. Uh, <coughs> so I wanted to take you one more place. This is a little bit different. Now, remember I told you I really like the Human Genome Project? GWAS is always, is, GWAS got a bit of a bad name. <coughs> well, okay, part of it was deserved. But uh, for the most part, I, th I would argue that we're just at the cusp of being able to take advantage of the fantastic information that we're getting in genetics. And so I wanted to just give you a little bit of a, of an in, uh, a discussion of where we're going and how we're trying to use particularly genomic information. Um, and this is a collaboration with uh, Chu Anji at the, um, in, in biomedical engineering at, in Singapore and Joanna Holbrook as a systems biologist. Now, what we're doing is we're, we're taking advantage of the same gusto cohort that I mentioned to you, and we've actually managed to affect brain imaging with the cohort um, at less than two weeks of age. Um, in fact, most of the kids are imaged between day four and day 10. You may think that's a feat. Um, I'd argue otherwise. It's the easiest age in the world you'll ever image somebody. You breastfeed them. Um, they go to sleep. You put them in the scanner. And has anybody ever had a kid Hello. It's a little tricky to sleep. Vibrations and noise? Yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. The most successful age you'll ever image, at least from my uh, humble experience. 187 out of 189 kids acquired good T2. So, um, and you let the kids, the, the, the only thing, obviously these kids are not sedated in the least. As I say, their scanning occurs in the evening when they go to sleep. The folks at University of North Carolina used the same protocol. It was actually developed at Washington University. So we've got imaging data from these kids at the time of birth. So one of the interesting things is that we can now start to really assess the impact of intrauterine life on brain structure and variation in brain structure and connectivity at the time of birth. We've got the images from that particular period. Uh, <coughs> so Angie, who is a brilliant imager and mathematician, has gone through and, and derived um, maps for um, uh, analyzing infant brain uh, um, at the level of T2 at volume as well as at the level of diffusion tensor imaging. So the atlas has been published. Um, what we see, I think, um, it has confirmed what has been reported previously by uh, people like Kelly Botterin and Claudia Boos and others, and that is that there are indeed um, clear, there is clear evidence uh, that structural variations in, stru in areas like the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex can be meaningfully associated with maternal mental health. We can see that at the time of birth. I think one of the things that <coughs> has been most impressive to us is that <coughs> in studies of connectivity is that you can actually see that there's differential patterns of connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, of which you've heard a great deal over the course of the last day and a half. That pattern of connectivity is apparent at birth in relation to antenatal maternal mental health. So there's an enormous amount of variation that comes to define individuals.
um, and their vulnerabilities that seems to be established in utero. Uh, <coughs> now here's one that, that just kind of blows me away because the question is, to what extent are these patterns established in utero of any predictive value? <coughs> now this is data in which there is a correlation, a statistical correlation between the internalizing scores on the child behavior checklist at 24 and 48 months and brain structure in the right amygdala or the right insular cortex, areas that you heard about over the course of yesterday. Um, and what you can see is at the level of the right amygdala, there's a significant correlation between volume and internalizing score at 24 months. It wanes clearly by 48. What occurs instead is that one now sees the insular cortex as a predictor. Now here's the punchline. This data was collected at birth. Right? We're not talking about insular cortex volume at 48 months. We're talking about it at birth predicting these outcomes at 48 months. So it's, it's rather intriguing to see that, that that imprint is actually sustained. <coughs> so if, if that didn't need much underscoring, we have a young mathematician working with us on this, Chong Yang Wee. And this was fun because he's a mathematician. He has, um, as of... April of this year learned that the brain is distinct from the foot, okay? So that he's well on his way to marching towards a neuroscience degree. <laughs> Needless to say, he's about as unbiased as you can be. <coughs> he's taking this particular data, he's taking uh, the neonatal imaging data in relation to uh, the child behavior checklist data. And what he's doing is, first of all, he's doing a completely unbiased, unbiased network clustering um, basically using graph theory, to look at clustering w across these 187 brains and asking which subjects cluster together, right? Irrespective of their brain region. He knows nothing about their brain regions. To him, these are all just numbers. He's trying to search within these numbers to find clusters. So he identifies clusters two, three, and four, which have values that are of coherency that are really quite impressive. Group number one, not so much, but groups two, three and four, particularly two and four, cluster very nicely. So he's got this cluster. He has no idea what is underlying it, but mathematically it forms a cluster. He then lays it on top of the CBCL data and finds that groups two and four differ quite significantly. And so all he knows then is that at 24 months of age, this cluster and this cluster differ in their in infant temperament. That is sustained into 48 months. So then he goes back and says, okay, what aspect of this correlational matrix best explains that relationship? Keep in mind, he's a mathematician, right? It's the amygdala and the insular cortex, right? So he's come at this in a completely unbiased way and again deduced that these structures and the clusters they're forming at birth are predictive of these particular outcomes. I think where that takes us in terms of thinking about interventions <coughs> is that we absolutely um, have every reason in the world to respect the very dynamic brain that is that of the child postnatally. At the same time, what this tells us, and I'm not suggesting we run MRIs or that this is even a good predictor, but it does tell us that there are signatures there at the time of birth that do seem to be a predictive value. So that, I think, is an optimistic scenario. So <coughs> last part of this is just an, uh, sort of a walkthrough of the ways that we're thinking about uh, genetic moderation. I use this slide. Um, you know, Dr. Bradley and many others had variants of this. It's just to simply say, yeah, we know that the impact of, of, um, of adversity, and particularly childhood adversity, on multiple outcomes is, is moderated by genotype. So the question then becomes, well, how do we do it? Now the candidate gene work has been remarkable in thrusting genotype and gene by E interactions into the forefront of our minds. The very fact that you guys can sit here and, and come to grips with the fact that substantial variation in the environment and its relationship to outcome is moderated by genotype is a huge conceptual advance. I mean, it, 10 years ago, that would have appeared quite antithetical to where we were. So our ability to grasp and know that we have to integrate these features is really quite good. So candidate gene studies have taken us quite a ways. <coughs> we also have to realize that candidate genes and the approach is limited. 
It's limited by the very fact the genes don't operate individually, they operate in networks. And they operate in ways that are very specific to certain types of tissue. So the question becomes, well, okay, what we want to identify are not so much underlying polymorphisms. We want to underlie and identify the gene networks that operate to define vulnerability or resistance. And in particular, we're not even really interested in the genes, we're interested in the biological systems that they represent. So what we're really doing is to interrogate the genome, not to have us underlie any single SNP. That's never going to happen, right? What we're doing is interrogating the genome to tell us within which genes do variants operate to moderate environmental impact, and what are the biological systems that are represented by those particular genes. So, hoping that that's somewhat clear, I'll tell you how we try to do that. Uh, we use what is a, 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 a technique very common within the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium and their colleagues these days called Genetic Profile Risk Score. So, when you think about the GWASs that have been done for most psychiatric diseases, that with the exception of schizophrenia, there's not been a lot of hits. And in depression, it's argued that there's none. But what you do have is a whole series of these SNPs, these polymorphisms, that are statistically quite closely associated, but they don't pass the rigorous standards of false discovery relationship. Now, what I think people have come to understand is the genetic architecture of psychopathology is that it is largely, or vulnerability is largely defined by cumulative effects of many different polymorphisms in genes that operate within networks. So the question is, well, how do you identify those? So one of the approaches is you do what's called a genetic profile risk. You say, okay, well, here are a bunch of genes that are nominally associated with, in this case, depression, and down here are a whole bunch that aren't. So what I'm going to do is, at different levels of stringency, I'm going to select these particular SNPs that are at least nominally statistically related to my outcome of interest, which in this case is major depressive disorder. So you can create these genetic risk profiles. Now, what Angie then found was that when she looks at these genetic risk profiles is they moderate the impact of either maternal depression or socioeconomic status on things such as amygdala, value, amygdala volume. So here, for example, you see that the um, higher the household income, the lower the volume of the right amygdala amongst individuals with high genetic poly risk scores, whereas individuals with low genetic poly risk scores are largely unaffected, etc. In other words, simply saying that this genetic poly risk score operates as you think it would to enhance sensitivity to environments that are known to be predictive of the risk for depression. So here's the deal. <coughs> the interaction between maternal depressive symptoms in utero and <laughs> the infant's genetic poly risk score is statistically associated with the right amygdala and the right hippocampus, uh, not the left, um, as well as the uh, level of socioeconomic status, meaning the effects of poverty, again on the right versus the, um, <coughs> significant to the right versus the left. And as you heard yesterday, there's good reason to assume that particularly the right amygdala as well as the right hippocampus are selectively involved in moderating um, uh, information associated with threat and distress. So now we've got a package of genetic polymorphisms that moderate the impact. The question is, can we hunt within those polymorphisms and find which ones are most closely associated with the outcome? In other words, which SNPs best account for these statistical outcomes? So we do that, and then what we do once we've found the SNPs that are most closely associated with the specific outcome, that is those SNPs that best moderate the relationship of maternal depressive symptoms with either right amygdala, right hippocampus, or prefrontal cortex, is we put them in a pathway analysis, right? We say, okay, well these SNPs, they're mapped on to particular genes take those genes, put them into a pathway, and see which of those genes cluster together to subserve specific biological systems. And when you do that, you find very specific systems that are then involved, and essentially, 